So I'm Jason Good. I was Trinity 97, law school 2000, and I'm now in my 21st year of law practice at Alston and Bird in Atlanta. Um, our special guest today is Dr. Travis Stork. Um, Travis and I have known each other for a very long time, and then we're lucky enough to over, I mean, pre-Duke, and then we're lucky enough to overlap our uh, Duke experiences, which was uh, which was awesome for me uh, as a freshman, getting to know a cool senior like Travis. And, uh, and our families have stayed close and he and I have stayed close. And so um, what we want to do today is just have a conversation to talk about his varied and interesting career, um, some of which um, you guys are probably familiar with um, because he has popped up on your televisions and in your uh, bookshelves um, from time to time. So uh, Travis is coming to us from Nashville. Uh, thanks again, Travis. And uh, how is your pandemic going? How, how is your family? And, and what are you doing to pass the time in Nashville? Well, well, let me just first say that having spent many years now in front of the camera, it's an incredible honor when I get to hang out with fellow Dukies. Literally, at all my travels in life, all the various jobs I've had, the greatest privilege I have is wherever I may be meeting fellow Dukies. So Thanks for uh, joining us today. And I'm, I'm like probably everyone else to some extent right now doing a lot of work from home. Uh, in addition, Jason, you know this, others may not, but in June we had a baby boy. So, you know, it, it's having a baby during COVID has been a unique experience, both a blessing and at times it makes it maybe a little more challenging. But, you know, the family's great. We've been able to spend extra time together because until – and I don't exaggerate when I say this, until probably around February, almost every week of my life, I would commute out to LA. And so I would typically fly out to LA on Tuesday or Wednesday and fly back to Nashville on Saturday. So a huge part of my life for the last 12 years was in LA. And now for a, a full year, I've, I've finally been boots on the ground in one place. So for me, not having to go to the airport every week um, something that took some getting used to, but I have to say, even though my frequent flyer miles aren't growing, um, time with the family is, so life is good. So for our Southern California folks, where would you spend your time out here? Where, where would you film the doctors and where did you live? And so were you, were you driving a lot or did you create a little uh, bubble for yourself when you were in LA? So I don't know how many on this Zoom are from LA proper, but I'll openly admit my first time out in LA, I was overwhelmed. So I grew up in the Midwest, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, went to Duke. I traveled all around, lived in DC, went to med school at UVA, was in Nashville for residency, et cetera, et cetera, Colorado. I moved out to LA to host the doctors and I literally was scared to death to drive a car. So I very quickly realized that I had to get a place close to Paramount Studios where we taped the show. So for 12 years, believe it or not, other than it used to be either a taxi or a car or Uber from the airport to my apartment, for 12 years, I only used a bike. And, and the other great thing about LA is it's always sunny. So it, maybe five to 10 days would come up where I'd wake up, get ready to get on the bike, and I'd look outside and think, oh my gosh, it's raining. <laughs> what do I do? But you know, my world pretty much lived around, for those of you who are familiar with Larchmont Village, really close to Paramount Studios, my world was right there. And I, I cultivated this. For me, it's just what worked out. I really liked it because that was where I lived. I would either walk or bike everywhere. And then when Uber came along, it opened up my world a little bit because I could... <laughs> you know, taking Uber down to the beach. But the other cool thing about LA for me was, you know, even though I did it for 12 years, it was never lost. I mean, when I would walk or bike through those gates and you'd see the Paramount water tower and, you know, it was just, it was such a surreal experience. And I would be lying if I said I didn't miss that a little bit because, you know, every time I would get to LA, get off the plane, it's sunny, then you fly home to Nashville. It's dark. It's cold. <laughs> so, so I miss LA. Yeah. Well, let's talk. So, uh, so we're all at home, or most of us are at home because of the pandemic. So, um, you know, as a as a doctor and as somebody who has made a profession of keeping track of sort of changes in the medical field, yeah, uh, you know, your experience was in ER medicine. What what are you hearing from your ER doctors? 
about um, about how they're delivering, you know, medical services, you know, really since, uh, you know, for about 11 months now. What what trends are you seeing and in, in what, in what's happening in the ER? Well, you know, one of the interesting things about my career is I, I, I view one arm of my career as a public health educator. I'm still on staff in the ER here in Nashville. And the, the biggest change, and this is a lot of people are surprised by this, but since the pandemic started, it's put such a pressure on the healthcare system, obviously. Um, but contrary to what people might believe, this is beyond the fact that obviously when you're working in a hospital or the emergency department, before we understood what this virus was, there was a lot of fear. You know, it's interesting. It's not, it's been a really difficult time for my colleagues who, you know, if, if their only line of work in their entire lives has been just emergency medicine, you know, it's just, it's a very interesting time because believe it or not, I've had friends lose their jobs as ER doctors. Um, yesterday, I was talking to one of my, my best friends, fellow ER doc, and we were talking about how last year, at least in Nashville, there was one job offered to a new ER doctor. So it's one of those interesting times where everyone would assume that, boy, it's a great time to be a doctor because there's a lot of business. The truth be told, this pandemic has created just so much chaos, uncertainty. Um, so the healthcare system, I think, is, you know, not to belabor this point, but this is going to be a great reckoning when we look back at it. And there's going to be, I think, you know, some, some shifts in healthcare and how it's delivered. Um, but it's, I have to say this, if anyone on this is uh, in the healthcare field, you know, doing both the entertainment side of things, also being an ER doc, I have just so much respect for, for everyone through all this who has been there um, treating patients. So much respect to anyone on this call who might be in the healthcare field. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah. Well, let's go back for people who maybe don't know as much of your story. What, what, when you graduated from Duke, um, what, what did you do next? What was your first job? And I think you went to DC. So tell us about wh where you went and what you did. You, for, you didn't mention my road trip to be a Chippendales dancer, Jason. I did not. For, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Of course. I, uh, you know, one of the great things about doing things like this is I look back at my career and at Duke, I was a math economics major. And so my first job out of college was in Washington, D.C. as an actuarial scientist. And so my first job, I had no one in my family had been a doctor. You know, I, I didn't really come from a family of academics, if you will. So it was just, OK, great. I, I'm good at math. Let's be an actuarial scientist. But after a few years of that, I realized I was plugging in a lot of numbers, predicting how long people would live, not really having any impact on that. So I I ironically volunteered at a free clinic called the um, Washington Free Clinic. And they, uh, Jason, I think I've told you this story. You know, I, first night I go in there, I know nothing about healthcare, but I just wanted to, I wanted to get my hands in there and, and try to do something where I could offer help. So they said, you know what's easy? You're going to be in charge of all the urine samples. So my first job ever in healthcare was I was in charge of all the urine samples and testing them. Here's the thing. No one told me you're supposed to wear gloves. <laughs> so, my first night ever in healthcare, I've got all these urine samples and I'm dipping the dipsticks in there. No gloves. Kind of like, oops. <laughs> so <laughs> over time, uh, volunteering uh, there, you know, it, it evolved into just the light bulb moment went off for me where I realized, you know what, this I have so much fun coming here and I feel really good about it. A couple of doctors took me under their wings and said, you know what, if you wanted to do this, you could go take classes at night. So, you know, before I went back to med school for anyone out there who's had multiple careers, I was an actuarial scientist, no pre-med classes at Duke whatsoever, just my math, econ, and, and my, my liberal arts classes. So I would at, at night um, go to either Georgetown or George Mason and take like organic chemistry, et cetera. And then, yeah, then you click your heels, Jason, and you're an ER doctor. Yeah, that it just <laughs> happens automatically. You know, but it but it is a good uh, lesson for anybody, which is that if what you're doing is not your ultimate goal, you're there can be a transition period, right? As you said, where you had a period of time where you had taken classes at night, knowing that I'm going to keep working and make money because I need to fund the rest of my education, 
but I'm going to start working at night towards the thing that I think I ultimately want to do. So, um, so you went to Virginia, obviously, and then um, your residency is, is I, I think. Oh, your- oh, real quick, Jason, I have to, I don't know if I've told you the story. My first day at UVA, because I had established residency in Virginia, loved UVA, but my first day I go into the UVA bookstore and there is a book that says, it's a book called 10 Reasons I Hate Duke. I'm looking at oh no, I'm gonna have some problems here. <laughs> so, oh, I have to throw that out there because after four years at UVA, love the experience. Um, but back to your point, you know, I, I'm forever Duke Blue. But the other thing with with Duke and and the education you receive there, not only in the classroom but amongst all of your friends outside the classroom, I've learned that you can do anything in life, anything. You you know. It, it, I never thought I'd be a doctor and, you know, I I know you're going to get to it, but I certainly never thought I would be on TV either. So, you know, that, and it all gets back to education and, and honing whatever craft or abilities you have. And Duke, Duke taught me that a lot of that. Yeah. So, um, well, and, and Virginia is sort of notorious for having a ton of Duke people in their graduate school program too. So at least, you know, maybe there was an occasional Duke sweatshirt you'd see when you were in Charlottesville. Um, so, so that was, so it was after your time at Virginia though, that brought you to Nashville for your residency. Is that right? Yeah. So I came to Nashville for residency at Vanderbilt and, um, you know, Jason, this was back in the time where, you know, your, your brother, fellow Dukey, Damon Good had, had gone to Vanderbilt for, for law school. Um, and so I, I went there for residency and ended up just happened to be in Nashville during that time where Nashville was starting to undergo major changes and trying to become Atlanta's little sister city. And so I fell in love with it. And, you know, I, in many ways I've, although I've traveled a lot since then, you know, Nashville's kind of been my home base ever since. Right. Right. So, um, all right. So Travis, you've, you're, you're an ER doctor, um, in Nashville, uh, you know, you probably got a career trajectory, you know, at least sort of in mind. And, and then I was one of many friends who, who got the news that you were going to become the next bachelor. And, and frankly, it is shocking that this series continues today. Right. And so it's, it's, you know, because you were the bachelor, it's not something that like died decades ago. I mean, it continues today. And so it, it is, it is in the public consciousness. But, but talk about that. Well, first of all, tell the story about how you were even approached because uh, I don't imagine you showed up at an audition. And then, and then how, do, how does one make the decision to take that sort of big step in life? Not only does it continue, my wife makes me watch it with her. So <laughs> it continues in the Stork household as well. <laughs> the um, producers would be very happy to hear that you're watching. It's interesting because you know, getting back to life. And I always try to live my life by Helen Keller's quote, life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And I had gone to dinner after a shift in the ER with about four fellow colleagues. And uh, someone came up to us, a woman came up to us and bought us a round of beers. And about 15, 20 minutes later, she's like, let me get another round. I'm trying to figure out what, what's the angle here. And it turns out it was a casting director for the bachelor who, um, unbeknownst to me got my friend's contact info and then the next day the you know call started coming in and it was just a whirlwind and within I I basically had to make a choice within about a week because they were already they had been in Nashville casting I guess for um for women to go on the show and I somehow some way I ended up out in LA in a I think I was in Studio City and you know, my, my whole ER crew, the chairman of the emergency department, my sister, my family is like, go do this, just go. And I did. And a month later I was in Paris and uh, you talk about shock to the system, you know, when you're, and I'm just going to not, I did very well at Duke, Jason. I did very <laughs> well at UVA. I was top of my class. I'm, I'm a, someone who's very committed to my craft of emergency medicine. It, it's a, it's definitely, um, a very unique thing when you get out of your comfort zone and do something like that. And so I struggled with it 
but at the same time, I, so many things have happened since then and I'm grateful for it. And, and, you know, I, um, I was reading an article, I can't remember last week and it was talking about the bachelor franchise, which has been on TV forever. Right. And, you know, if, if anyone ever probably read an article about me, it would be that, you know, <laughs> nothing really eventful happened. Right. Because, so, so the moral of the story is I had a great experience. The show rated well, and I came home and I just had to get used to sort of being recognized. But beyond that, you know, after I realized after about six months to a year, you know what? All right. So I was the bachelor. So be it. But it took me, it took me a long time to, yeah, you know, you go down a certain path, Duke education, med school, residency, yeah. ER doctor, and then, hey, that's the bachelor. <laughs> you know, it takes some getting used to for sure. Well, I'll give you I'll give you credit for picking a year when they took you to Paris. There's a lot of people who would sort of spend their year in you know Southern California or wherever. So you got some great venues uh, when you were on it. So you get to see the world a little bit. That's cool. And then tell the story just about your because you go away and you film it right, and then you come home and you just sort of like are re-entering life in uh, you know in Nashville, and then all of a sudden it starts. It starts, you know, showing up on, you know, Monday nights on ABC. And so is it is it just immediate that like people like stop you and know you or does it take a couple of weeks or like what was that like to all of a sudden? Of course, you know, you had those experiences, but nobody else does. And so then all of a sudden people are like, oh, my gosh, like what was that like that those first few weeks? Well, I'll first say I never had any intention of being on TV ever. I had never even considered it until this happened. So Jason, you go, you film, I'm in Paris and they treated me great. I had a French Chateau. I had a, like, I think it was about a 500 acre estate. I had a mountain bike. I, I I had the time of my life in, in many ways, but then I got home, I was working in the ER and of course, all my friends knew it's Monday night and we have to, we have to all get together. I went to work on Tuesday morning and my life had changed. I, it, it was the cra- like that, the craziest thing I've ever experienced because, you know, you're walking from one patient room to another and there are literally people, oh my gosh, that's him trying to take a picture of you or can, can I get an autograph? <laughs> and for someone who had never been on TV and who, who didn't understand what that meant, Um, I had to take a really quick, hard lesson in, you know, what that means. And I always say I'm very blessed that it happened to me when I already had the maturity to, to deal with it. I, there's a reason why childhood people who become famous at an early age, why they self, um, a lot, a lot of them, I'm not going to say everyone, but people go through a really tough time. It's because it's, it's not easy. And so I, it took an adjustment for me. I had to, when I was in the ER working, I, I'm not even kidding when I say that there was a room, like this dictation room that was kind of private and they would basically just reserve it for me to go back there and do my dictations because during that time, it was, uh, it was just, it was quite overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. So, so when, you're, when you're done with that and that dies down, do you have in your mind a thought that, that I'm going to just, go back to being an ER doctor and that was a nice chapter or is there is there any thought that you want to you know maybe continue to be involved with media or 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 what what happens to then sort of set you on your next path of of um you know writing books and and being on being on tv how does that how does that play out and what was your mindset like Jason, I did what everyone does when they want to ultimately end up in Hollywood and that is I moved to Breckenridge, Colorado. <laughs> 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 the, log- the logical halfway step to California. Yeah, it was, you know, I was born in Colorado and I'd always had this idea of being an ER doctor in the mountains. And so I, I worked at two ERs in Denver and an ER out in the mountains. And uh, anyone who, uh, who's ever been skiing out in Summit County at Keystone or Breckenridge or Copper Mountain, you know, there's actually a really nice level three t- trauma center hospital there. And so that was one of the hospitals I worked at. And i I lived out in the mountains and I, you know, 
I was single um, and my dog and I would get up in the morning and go skin up mountains and ride our mountain. I mean, it was just a crazy time. But to your point, one of the most interesting things that happened to me um, before I had moved out to Colorado is a William Morris agent had reached out to me and just said, look, do you mind if, if I just keep my ear out there, if something comes up, just can I at least let you know? And, um, and after about a year of just spending time in the mountains and really finding myself again, uh, that's when Dr. Phil and his son, Jay McGraw had reached out and said, look, we're thinking about doing a show called the doctors and we watched you on the bachelor and we think you would be a good host. So that's how that all started. So it was, and did that come through that woman at, at William Morris? Well, she was, she was the one who I think, um, you know, her name was Kathy Armistead. And to this day, I owe her a debt of gratitude because I was really somewhat resistant to the idea because it was just, again, going on TV initially, very overwhelming, but she was like, look, Travis, you know, use this platform. Um, and yeah, it, it, even that was a whirlwind because I flew out to LA and anyone in the production world knows that at least back then, back then, this is before streaming, this is before social media, you know, and, and this is back when King World Productions was, was running a lot of syndication, you know, roll out to LA, they put a teleprompter up there and Dr. Phil says, hey, I'm gonna teach you how to read a teleprompter. And then they bring an audience in and they're like, all right, we're gonna film a show we called a pilot. And I did that. and flew back to Colorado. And then six months later, I found out that the show was, was happening. So that, and then again, another whirlwind, you get in the car, you pack up, you drive out to LA, another culture shock, but through all of it, you know, kind of not to digress too much, but through all of it, one of the big centering things for me is that, you know, I was, I had trained for so long to be an ER doctor so ironically, my place of comfort would be when I would go back to the ER. So when I'm in the ER, I'm just an ER doc. And of course, people would recognize me. But at the same time, it, it, it was sometimes a good thing because instead of a strange face when you're, you're showing up at the ER with an emergency, it would be a familiar face. Hopefully, I was someone that they, you know, did not dislike <laughs> yeah. based on watching TV. But, you know, it was a... The ER ironically prepared me really well for this path I went on out to LA because and anyone who's spent time in the ER knows it's chaotic. Uh, a lot of stuff is thrown at you. you. You have to be sort of prepared for the unexpected. So ironically going out to LA, you know, TV was, um, I hesitate to say this, but it was, it was a fun departure but the, the, the rigors of the ER made it, I do not want to use, this is, I don't want to use the word easy. That's not the right word. Yeah. Prepared. It, I was prepared for sort of the chaos of like, look at camera two, camera seven. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, and so it, yeah. it felt almost like room one, room seven, room six. Yeah. Okay, cool. If you hadn't okay. been trained, if you hadn't been trained in that chaos, that might've been overwhelming for people. I think uh, so. Yeah. I think so. Interesting. There's a, you know, I, I, uh, the reason that we started this series was to sort of look at the business, um, you know, aspects of certain things. And it is interesting, the woman at William Morris, who, who, who almost took you on as a project, despite the fact that you weren't altogether willing, right? There's a lesson there for all of us that like, that like, sometimes you can pursue opportunities that, um, that aren't obviously presenting itself to you, but you can sort of make those opportunities happen by, maintaining relationships by, um, by keeping up with people in your, in your sphere. And, and then it can really, you know, turn into something. So, so it started with like you had some guest spots initially, right on like Dr. Phil's show before the doctors came around. Am I remembering it? I rem am I remembering that right? Yeah, it was all simultaneous to okay. the outside world. It seemed like I, you know, it was they, they made a decision yeah. I, I, they did have me come out and do some some spots on Dr. Phil just to see how I did on camera. But it was this was all somewhat in preparation for behind the scenes. What was 
hopefully building a, a new show. Right. And one of the coolest things, just to throw this out there, you know, one of the great things people forget that 10, 11, 12, 13 years ago, doctors on TV, even health matters on TV were not a real common thing. And so I do feel like we helped change that a little bit, which was a really, you know, uh, for me, it, it was a great way of helping to justify this massive career change. But I also, to anyone listening, you know, I, I spent a lot of time probably worrying too much about, frankly, what others would think of me. Because here I am again, Duke trained, a Vanderbilt, um, you know, Vanderbilt, because at that point in time, I went back as faculty at Vanderbilt. So I'm a faculty physician at Vanderbilt Medical Center. And there's always in the back of your mind this thought, okay, is everyone just going to view me as a TV doctor now? And you know, we all have some preconceived notions about TV, but it took me, it took me some time to realize that, you know, I have my new boss when I'm on TV is a viewer at home. So I never lost sight of, you know, when you go on TV, there's someone watching your show in Iowa who may, you know, may not feel comfortable with the healthcare system. And so that opportunity, it allowed me to sort of, uh, I'll just call a spade a spade. You know, it, it allowed me to put to the wayside some of my concerns where, well, I'm a, I'm a, vac a faculty physician. I, I have to be very careful on TV. It allowed me to, to have a little bit more fun and just acknowledge that, look, this is, this is who I am on TV, which is obviously going to be, you have to be entertaining. <laughs> no one yeah. is going to watch a doctor for an hour on TV if you're boring. And then, it's okay then if, if you're back in the ER, which is quite frankly more serious. But melding those two personalities was not, it was the same person, but you know, it was kind of an interesting adventure. I get off the plane sometimes on Saturday night in Nashville. I go to the ER Sunday morning and it was, I mean, your friends are, are just giving you grief. It's like, you know, I can't believe you did that on Friday. Are you kidding me? Why'd you take your shirt off again, Travis? Like, yeah, you know. We're yeah, we're trying to get some eyeballs on the TV. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. So uh, it's a different audience, though, watching daytime syndicated television, though, than is watching The Bachelor, right? So all of a sudden... The people who are coming up to you in the Nashville grocery store may be a little bit a little bit different uh, uh, viewer than you might have had the first the first time you were on TV. Did you did you find that 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 your that your that your target demographic was changing? Well, it gets back to the trajectory or adventure in life, right? When I never identified as the Bachelor, it's you know you've known me for a long time, right? I'm I'm you I'm not the person you would have expected. No to go on The Bachelor. So I never identified with, with that. Doesn't mean I didn't have a great experience. It doesn't mean that I have anything but positive um, memories and, and had a great experience. But it's different when you're going up to someone or someone's coming up to you in the grocery store and they're really concerned about your personal life versus they're coming up to you because, you know what, the advice you gave last week about how I can be healthier by adding more nuts to my diet well, that's a much better interaction if you're me. Yeah. And so it was, uh, you know, I, I'll admit it. I probably needed all of this to happen because when push comes to shove, I didn't want to spend my whole life being remembered as the bachelor. I, I, again, no shame in it. It's, but I was a doctor first. Yeah. <laughs> so doctor when people after. come up, yep. yeah, it, it was a, it was a refreshing change because I found people interacting with me more and more asking health questions and not health questions that were uncomfortable. It wasn't someone coming up saying, hey, you know, should I have surgery on my heart? Although that would happen occasionally. It would usually be, hey, I, I heard this tip you gave. I started to add more, you know, this thing called quinoa, <laughs> <laughs> which 12 years ago, quinoa wasn't cool. No one really knew what quinoa was. And like, do you like this quinoa? And, and it'd be fun. I'd be like, oh yeah, I love quinoa. Hey, come over here. Here's another whole grain that I love to eat. Check it out. And that's yeah. fun. Well, that is interesting because you could definitely impact people through that show. You know what I mean? And I'm sure that that feedback would come to the producers and others. Like when you guys did a uh, segment that 
really resonated with people. It's like you can change behaviors because you're touching so many people. Uh, so that's that's really cool. That's the power of television. So that show is nationally syndicated. So um, so did that did that impact you at all as being on it? Did you have to go out and sort of help sell the show to to stations or you know for those of us who aren't in the TV industry, what the fact that it's nationally syndicated? What does that what does that mean and how does that impact you? you know, as somebody who's in front of the camera? Well, I learned a lot, obviously, about television production, but also the, um, you know, they're, they're big, two big elements, right? If you're, if you're a network show and I'm on at 1 p.m. on ABC, that's pretty simple, right? You're, you're, you're on ABC in every city in America. When you're syndicated, you're literally on a different station, potentially in every single city in America. So you're on in Nashville, you might be on ABC and Denver, you might be on NBC. And so, yeah, it's, it's almost like you're selling a product piecemeal to various markets. And then of course there are bigger station groups. So I learned a lot about that. I did. And the part about the business that looking back, obviously I was naive at the time, but you know, I probably traveled to every single city in America, including some of the smaller ones. You're meeting with station managers, you're meeting with the advertisers in their communities because everyone's trying to get a sense for, is this a show where I would like to spend money to advertise? And people forget, you know, in, in entertainment, much like anything else, it's not always just ratings, right? So if I have a product and I'm trying to sell it, and let's just say it's a reputable brand and it's a health-related product, well, I'm, I'm going to be much more inclined to pay for advertising on a show that I think would represent my product well than, you know, maybe on a daytime show that you are the father. It's, you know, and so that I, I, I began to learn over time that TV isn't just about ratings. It's also about, you know, a brand attaching itself to you and, um, and a show. And so that business side, obviously, I learned a lot about it over the years. And it's, you know, it's an interesting, fascinating industry that's changing rapidly, just because obviously, everything is evolving when it comes to entertainment. And, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't have pop up ads on your, you know, on your computer like you have now. So obviously, advertiser dollars can choose a lot of different places to spend their money. So Dave Carger, uh, Duke 95, who's in front of the camera, just ask us uh, or ask me to ask you, what's one thing that you miss about about doing the doctors and what's one thing that you don't miss? I, I miss hosting the show, the act of hosting the show. And Dave, you're in front of the camera. You know that there is a, undoubtedly a certain energy that comes, especially for a live studio audience where you get out there and there's a great energy. What I don't miss, there's probably two elements. I do not miss getting on a plane twice every week. Um, and I don't miss, you know, I'm not going to get into details, but you know, there, there, there's a lot that you deal with in Hollywood that people do not see. There are a lot of battles. There are a lot of um, varying opinions. There are a lot of um, individuals that go into what you end up seeing on TV. And, you know, it, that stuff isn't always pleasant. Again, you don't see it on TV, but, um, you know, that part I do not miss at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me change gears just a little bit. While, while you were running the show or uh, while you were on the show, um, you wrote several books and, and a bunch of them were on the New York Times bestsellers list. So, so let's talk about that for a second. When, when did you, you know, what was your first experience like? What did you learn? And then, and then, and then sort of what was your, what was your philosophy behind wanting, you know, to add essentially a third thing that you were doing, right? Not only are you an ER doc, but you're hosting the show and now you're going to, you know, write a book and, uh, at the same time. So it's a, it's a long question, but but what were your thoughts well, it, and, and how did, how did it go? So it went great. And I'll back up though and say that, you know, when you're an ER doctor, um, patients come to you, you're not sitting there thinking about marketing. You're not thinking about 
oh my gosh, I wonder if people will really like my 5.0 nylon sutures when they come into the ER. <sighs> the, the first um, book I wrote after I hosted the doctors was called The Doctor is In, um, Seven Steps to Optimal Wellness. And I researched this book. I was so busy working in the ER, hosting the show, working on this book, and it came out and nobody bought it. <laughs> okay. So I learned, and this is applicable to whatever industry you're in, that you can spend a lot of time on something and a lot of your, your energy, but if no one sees it, reads it, or hears about it, then that's, that could be a lot of wasted energy, right? Unless it's for you, unless it's, you know, people journal for you. But I wrote that first book because I was passionate and I talked about everything in it, you know, all the you know, is garlic good for preventing colds? Is it chiropractic manipulation? Is it legit or not legit? But no one wanted, people did not want to buy a book to go see the doctor. So the doctor is in, they didn't want that. So I learned from that experience. And I learned based on all the questions I was getting both on the show and in the ER as well, what people really want is they want to learn how to almost become their own doctor and how to maximize their own health. And the number one way to do that is nutrition. So my next book was a book on nutrition um, that I did with, with um, men's health. And I knew that I was on to something because I could talk about all the things I was doing in my own daily life. And I would give little 10 second prescriptions. Like for instance, I never travel ever without mixed nuts ever. Because if I'm at an airport and I'm hungry, I'm going, to, I'm not one of those people who has enough self-control to just not eat. So, you know, there, there are so many little things that I've utilized over the years. And I realized in books, I could, could give those tips and sort of highlight some of um, the tools I use. And what's interesting also in medicine, you know, things change every five to 10 years, what you were doing five to 10 years before might be no longer valid. And so, you know, I wrote a book called The Doctor's Diet that um, went to, to number one. And it was it was this good title. It was really cool because I never had experienced anything like this in my life. Not good enough at Duke to play basketball. So I was never there where I could see the rankings. But this was the first time in my life where the book came out and people read it and they were telling their friends about it. And it was it went to number one on Amazon and it was like it, it sold out and friends were calling like how can I get a copy and I heard this really helped so and so and it was it was a really cool experience for me but it made me realize that you know the doctor's diet was a book not that different than the doctor is in right but because people we were all driven to some extent by vanity right we want to look good we want to feel good and in many ways just by renaming a book it, it did really well. And so um, since that time, you know, the last book I wrote um, was something called the lose your belly diet. And that was based on using your gut microbiome and how that plays a huge role in our health, our immune response, our weight. And so again, I, I, I and, and that book also fortunately went to number one, because again, it was you're teaching people or telling people what they need to know and you're, you, but you're, you're marketing it as something that they really, really want, right. To look good, to feel good. And then in the book, if you, if anyone's read any of my books, it's all the little things I'm doing every day. And it's, so it's, it, books are kind of an interesting phenomenon that way. Um, and I'd be lying if I said that I'm not currently in the midst of, of writing another book. And a lot of that is based on more of my personal experiences with spine surgery. And, you know, anyone who's a parent out there knows that you can have the best intentions when it comes to your health, but once you're a parent, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times your health takes second, is becomes second fiddle to, uh, to your yeah. kids. The feeding and clothing, the little people. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so, do you, you know, increasingly like in, in sports, uh, even like within like the Duke basketball players, right there, 
they think of themselves as a brand, right? And going to Duke and playing basketball for Coach K, that's good for my brand. And then when I come out, I'm going to sign with these companies. Did you, did you ever have a point where you started to think of yourself as a brand and how you put yourself out in the public or, or were you doing those things without ever thinking about using the word, the brand or like, like, does that, or is just sort of like you're, because you were on TV every day, is that just, you, you know, your public persona is out there and you, and by doing a great job at the, you know, hosting the doctors that your brand sort of takes care of itself. Okay. Two part answer to that. And, and the first one is a mea culpa, which is, I remember a long time ago being in a meeting with my agents saying, okay, Travis, we need to create what your brand is going to be. And I remember <laughs> looking at them thinking, I, what are you talking about? I'm brand. I'm, I'm just me. And <laughs> I mean, the first time all of us heard that somebody being a brand, we were like, well, get over yourself. Right. And so, yes, because your first yeah. reaction is, are you kidding? Having said that, you know, I'm, I turn 49 next month and I've grown, I've learned a lot about the business. And if, if whatever business you're in, if you don't cultivate your own brand, who you are, someone else will either do it for you or it may, you may not be, your brand may, be, may not be authentic to you. Are. So branding to me is, it's a, the semantics of it, I don't like, right? I think it's more so when you look in the mirror authentically, who do you see? Yeah. And in an ideal world, whatever business you're in, obviously in TV, you're more outward facing. But when you look in the mirror, who do you see? And that's what your brand should be. The, the, this is the God's honest truth. And I don't want to throw Hollywood under the bus. But my first week out there, someone took me aside and they said, Travis, it doesn't matter with it doesn't matter whether what you say is true or not. You just say it with so much conviction that it doesn't matter, that people will believe you regardless. And I think you talk about the COVID pandemic. I think we've been dealing with the a different type of epidemic of just people will say whatever they want to say in politics, et cetera. And they say it so confidently with so much conviction, it does work. But I think when it comes to like who you are authentically, it will catch up to you if you are being inauthentic or you're not being true about who you are. And that's been my experience because if you're authentic, no matter what you're doing in life, you're going to be okay. If you're right. inauthentic. So to, to, to sort of put a bow on that whole story, you know, here I am and I'm a new dad and uh, actually I'm going to introduce my son to everyone because here bring him over because there is a duke basketball game ironically starting in 45 minutes yeah on the acc so, network there he is so just because i had to show off the hat look look at the screen we got I'm a little buddy dookie here everyone so i love it you know but but brands um i think it's important to know who you are and now that i'm older i realize that that one of the most important things you can do in life, again, whatever career you're in is own your brand. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something I'm getting better at. And, you know, and help shape it, right? I mean, and help shape it, control, control the narrative. I mean, you can't always, you know, especially if you're a public person, somebody can write an article about you and you couldn't do anything about it, but, but there are things that you can, can do to try to shape your public image um, or shape your image at your own workplace or whatever. Talk to me. So you weren't um, you weren't on Instagram for a long time, and uh, and and now and now you are. How have you found that experience to really sort of dive in? And you're active on it, uh, Travis Dork, MD. Uh, uh, so uh, how have you found that experience? And do you do, do you like the sort of the give and take of it, or do you largely shut that out? Or like, just what are your thoughts about? About I have doing mixed, it mixed feelings on it, Jason. And I think it's, if you spend too much time living your life thinking about how will this look to others, it's very dangerous. Having said that, I am engaging more because it is also is a great way to engage with it, with others. And I was very late to the game because I'm an old timer, right? You know, <laughs> when you're Duke 94, <laughs> you're... <laughs> I didn't even have email in college. <laughs> now I'm supposed to post on, on social media. But having said that, you know, I think I've gone through a career evolution and, and, you know, my wife is 
been good about trying to get me more engaged. And I, ironically, I look back at my life and I'm, I'm hopefully less than halfway through it. So I have this conversation with everyone today, not looking back, but I'm looking forward. And, you know, here I am. And, and if, if I look back and I was an actuarial scientist, okay, that's part of who I was. ER doctor, part of who I am. Host of a show called The Doctors, part of who I am. For a few short months of my life, I was even The Bachelor, part of who I am. But now it's like, okay, dad, and all these things together, getting back to your brand and who you are, it evolves over time. And, and I'll say this only to because I think it's important. As I look back, I don't have any regrets, but at the same time, I think I was always naive enough to, <laughs> I naively thought that in most environments, everyone's on the same team, right? So ironically, I think it's important for everyone to, to sort of take stock of, of who they are back to you know, what their brand is, who their authentic self is, and just make sure that no matter what, that you own that. And I think that's why I'm excited about my future because I can't sit here and say 1000% what it will look like. Um, but, you know, Jason, you and I were talking about how so much has changed in the world. And one of those big changes is SoCal will always be the center, I think, of the entertainment universe. But you can do you can do those things now in places like Atlanta where you are. Yep. Um, you know, I'm working on some stuff now that that will potentially be Nashville based. That's really exciting, and it, it's it's a neat time just because although again SoCal is the epicenter and probably will be forever, um, you can you can still do um, a lot of things in the quote unquote entertainment industry even if you're, you're not living in SoCal. Well, I mean, I think we're seeing that in a lot of industries where, you know, everybody used to come to the same office and now they can do their job from home. And does it really matter if you're in LA or if you go spend a month in Idaho? Nobody probably knows unless you're, unless you're shooting your camera out the window and they can see snow on the ground. Uh, and so um, it'll be interesting, you know, because in other states have been really aggressive in going after that, that industry. I mean, Georgia was one of the early adopters of, of really, you know, lucrative tax credits and it would bring down the cost of a production. And when you're trying to make money making television, those those things matter. So um, so it'll be interesting to see how much that that continues over the next few years. And I have to add, you know, one of the ironies of being someone who, when you're traveling back and forth between Nashville and LA, you actually tend to travel with some of the same people. <laughs> and, you know, Nashville is, obviously an entertainment capital, probably more so in the music world. Sure. But it's funny because now um, you're starting to see more and more people who are actually traveling from LA to Nashville to do work, which yeah. is just kind of a crazy concept because it used to be everyone was traveling from Nashville to LA to do work. You know, now it's even some people that I work with and used to work with in LA they're coming here now some to do some work in Nashville. And so I think it'll be, it'll be an interesting, the disruption over the next five to 10 years, I think will be very interesting. Yeah. To see how it all plays out. And we've seen that in Georgia. I mean, when, when people tell you that their neighbor, that, that their neighbor's house was just sold to Woody Harrelson or Melissa McCarthy. I mean, that just shows you how much time people like that are spending outside of, of what we think of as the traditional, you know, sort of entertainment capital. So um, so do you have plans to go back in the ER? Are you going to start uh, uh, treating patients or is it is the hospital world just sort of so upside down right now because of the pandemic that that that, that will come later for you? No, I've, st I've stayed on staff in the ER through all this, through all the okay. years. So, you know, it, it's that's been important to me. It's actually going to probably be the opposite. I think when I turn, you know, <laughs> I can't remember my staff privileges come up, but it's maybe a year and a half from now. I'll be 50. I think there's a decent shot that, you know, it's a young man's game, Jason. <laughs> a lot more grays coming in every day. Yeah. Well, and those are, those are, and those are, are, those are tough hours. Those are not nine to five hours. <laughs> and that's, that's, that can be grueling work as we've all seen and appreciated by watching what the ERs have gone through, you know, over the last 11 months. So.
Uh, no, it, 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 it's true. But, you know, one of the one of the most beautiful things and and I will. Um, not not to close this off prematurely, but, you know, in life, especially for those of us and I'm very proud of my Duke education, I'm, I'm proud of so many of my friends. And it, it's kind of amazing because, Jason, you're not a part of this, but about 17 or 18 of my friends in my class from Duke over the last, oh, I don't know, year, have actually started doing some occasional Zooms and text threads. And it's remarkable to me all of the amazing things that my friends are doing. And and I'm not talking necessarily about work. I'm talking about volunteering. I'm talking about doing things that matter, that are changing the world. And it's cool because I think a lot of times you go to college and you assume maybe you're, you're, you major in one thing. For me, I, I math guy. I literally thought I would spend my whole life as an actuarial scientist and that would have been fine. But I think one of the beauties of life, especially when you have that, that, um, that great education to lean on is reinventing your, your life. Who knows what you're going to do in the future? And we're never stuck. And that evolution is it's exciting. It's scary at times. This pandemic in and of itself has created so much chaos and, and people have lost their jobs that maybe they've been in their whole careers wondering if they'll ever come back. And, you know, in a, in a weird, strange way, not to get on a soapbox here, but um, it's at moments like these where, you know, I feel so very blessed. My, one of my big anchors in life has always been my Duke friends and my Duke connections. And so even when Duke basketball is seven and seven and Duke football is two and nine and, you know, our, it, it, it's hard to get everyone texting about the the big game it's you know it's still just a huge part of who I am yeah well it was awesome that you and I were there together and that uh we both uh share such an awesome affinity and and I'll just say you know listening to your story again it's um I'll just give you so much credit for taking chances and and uh in your in your career and just listening when somebody offers you something um I, you know, and I say that because I'm somebody who's had the same job since I graduated from law school. And so I have not, you know, and I'm happy with that. Don't worry, I'm not complaining. But it's just, it's so interesting for me to hear the pivots that you have taken in your career to say, well, I'm trained to do this, but now I can do this and and I can do this and I'll figure that out. And um, and I think you're, you know, even the books are a great example of a lot of people would have written that first book and said, wow, that that didn't work for me. I'm done with that. And for you to say, okay, let me take the lessons I've learned and I'm going to write a different book and I'm going to, and I'm going to think about it a different way. And then we'll find success and be at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. That's, that's a testament to your stick to And so, um, so I but can't Jason, wait to see what, go ahead. No, no, nothing in life will ever be as difficult as my abstract algebra class at Duke. So I figure uh, <laughs> if, if I got through that. Yeah, I think every I get through I think everybody on this call can just insert <laughs> their hardest class into that uh, sentence. I, you will not, you did not find me uh, in abstract algebra, but uh, I've got my own. So, uh, well, you're awesome to talk to us. Thanks so much for sharing these stories. Um, I think I'm sure a lot of people have um, have come across you on their televisions, and so for them to make that due connection with you is awesome, and to hear sort of behind the scenes on your career has been has been really fun. So. Buddy, good to see you. Thanks for doing it.